Hi, it's Carolyn. In today's show, we indulge in the gravelly voice and New York ways of Hall of Fame trainer Nick Zito. Zito started in the 60s as a hot walker and groom and credits three African-American grooms, guys named Gene Stevens, Cliff, and 50 Cents, with teaching him the basics of horsemanship. Zito also recalls details of the training ways of Whiteley, Woody Stevens, Jerkins, and Jolly, and even gives a nod to Frank Sinatra. This is Racehorses Etc., the podcast celebrating horsemanship. I'm Carolyn Conley. I've covered horse racing on TV for over a decade, exercised some of the best horses in the world, and represented top jockeys. Here, I speak to icons and everyday racing folks to deepen our understanding of horsemanship. Nick Zito, thanks so much for coming on Racehorses, etc. I have admired you since I watched you win the Kentucky Derby twice. And then I actually drove my pickup truck to South Florida and work for ABC Sports when you had Louis Couture's in the Florida Derby. So it's wonderful to have you here. Oh, no, thanks. You've been a, you've been a favorite of mine over the years, too. You do a great job and um, everybody knows uh, you certainly know what you're doing and you know the history of the game, which is important, and you do your homework, and uh, you're very good at it. So I'm glad you're doing this now. Well, I appreciate good. it. Thank you, Nick. And, you know, I really have a fondness for horse trainers with a lot of experience. I used to get teased about it by some of the other jocks agents. They're like, what is it with you and these guys? But I really feel like horsemen that have experience and have learned from the best are a treasure. And you're one of those guys. You are so Thank important you. to this game. Uh, so that's so kind of you. Well, I think one of the things that, you know, you mentioned is, you know, naturally experience is there. You know, you, you, you walk in a gate, you're a young guy and, you know, you, you find something you love and you say to yourself, wow, I'm going to, you know, I want to do this. And next thing you know, you're doing it forever. No vacations, you know, no time off, no anything, just you know, the full, the full deal, like they say, once in a blue moon, you might get a day here, a day off. So it's the way it is, but, um, thank you for for saying that. I think that's what it is. I think, uh, why you admire so many of these people is because, um, of their, you know, of their longevity. And, you know, I, I think when, what did someone say once to me? Uh, oh yeah. If you want to be great at something, it's called consistency. And I think, um, you know, hopefully I'm in that class with the trainers that you mentioned that, you you know, and uh, thank you for saying that. So it's an honor. Thank you for and a a great compliment. Well, let's go back to the beginning. You walked on the track as a hot walker. Mm -hmm. Like myself, you were a groom and you worked your way up. What drove you to the track in the first place and who were the first people you worked for? Well, uh, drove me to the track is my dad, he... um, he tried to get a job, if you could believe it. Oh, way back when, if you know I me, mean, you know how old I am, so figure it out. So he tried to get a job with Max Hurst, the legendary trainer, uh, riding horses. This was, you know, I don't know how long. Then he went in the Army, whatever he did, and then he got a job, worked for the city. But he used to love racing, and he would take me to the track, and I was too young to get in the track and sometimes he'd have the security guards watch me and before you know it, it got my blood. And then, uh, as I got to be 12, I used to try to jump the fence to get in the track, which I did a couple of times. And it, um, you know, it was so interesting. It's, you know, it's uh, scary now when you go back and think about it, but so it got my blood. Then I decided to be a hot walker because I didn't want to, you know, I love the horses so much. And I got a job on the track as a hot walker. There was actually a fella in the neighborhood had a, he had two horses. He was a trainer named Frank Stallone. He had two horses. He worked for a guy named Saul Rutchick and they had a, I think a derby horse called Count Turf. He was the assistant and he got a few horses and he was in our neighborhood. So he, you know, he'd, he'd take us over there and got in my blood. Then, It was a trainer that won a lot of races named Buddy Jacobson at the time. Not David Jacobson, Buddy. He was, you know, that was quite a story, too. So I walked horses for him. 
Bobby Frankel, I think, worked for him, too. And uh, I, I had been a hot walker for Buddy. And then, as that got in my blood, I'm in his barn, and this gentleman by the name of Woods Garth says to me, would you like to go to Kentucky? So I said, yeah. So I ran home, told my brothers, my mom, whatever it was. And um, dad, I said, uh, I told them, they said, what? You're going to go there? I said, yeah, I'll be back. I want to go to Kentucky. So I got on a van and I went to Kentucky. I went to Keeneland, where I am now, if you can believe it. That's 50 years, you know, probably, who knows, 40-something, 50 years. <laughs> Can't count. But anyway, uh, I get off the van because I love horses. And I thought there was something wrong with my ears because there was no announcer at the time. There was no announcer. Right. And that was kind of cool. And I went on a van with a horse called Summer Scandal that Mr. Garth had. Walter Blumrow, I'm a teenager, whatever. They had a picture of the horse winning. And it stayed in the Keeneland Library forever. Mr. Greeley, that uh, was one of the offices of Keeneland, uh, it stayed there forever. So I'm just a young kid in the picture. And that was 1966, I think. You weren't born yet, maybe. And then uh, then um, Mr. Bassett, who was the president for years and the emeritus, you know, we call him the general, 25 years later, I come back with Strike the Gold. He tells me, welcome back. And I win the oh. bluegrass. So, and that's 29 years ago. So, uh, and here I am now back here because of the pandemic. You know, the virus, we didn't know what to do. So, usually we go up to Saratoga early or try to get some young horses ready. I don't have as many as I used to have, but still, you know, you know, if you got a few, it's it's a it's a great place to train the young horses. So I said, ah, you know, and I told everybody, I said, let's let's just go to Keeneland. Let's just see because it's a neutral place, and let's try this. So uh, that's where I am now. So, you know, what's his name? Bon Jovi has that song. Who says you can't go home? <laughs> that's a cool deal. You know? <laughs> it's a cool deal. You're so still- that's uh, yeah, it's some of the some of the things. But along the way, you know, you if I go back now. Was it 20 when I met you? I guess it's 24 years ago. Is that, am I right? Yeah. 1996? Yes. yes. So that was a good year with Louis Couture's. And uh, we stopped Wayne. Wayne had won all those triple crowns in a, in a row. And uh, our preakness with Louis stopped him, which was good. Stopped his winning streak. Grindstone. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. We stopped it with Louis Couture's. And uh, yeah. he had won a lot. So that was good. And, uh, uh, you know, just uh, appreciate all the, all the things. I'm still doing it. You know, it's like everything else. You know, you, you're looking for another good horse. And uh, I think that one of the things that makes a, a trainer like myself keep pushing on, I don't have the horses I used to have. I have a horse or two here and there. And, you know, I still hope and push on. You see the other fellas that are still doing it, like Barkley Tag, you know, uh, who's got the favorite now for – the Belmont and, you know, possible Derby horse and Wayne Lucas, who's a, you know, a legend and icon. And you mentioned, I think Art Sherman was on your show not long ago, right? Yes. So you have all these people, you know, that are getting up there. Like I would say, you know, maybe we're at the top of the stretch, but that means we still got a quarter of a mile left, I think. So that's good. You know what I mean? You, so I keep doing it. You just keep doing it. You just keep trying to, uh, you know, to, to hang in there. So, you know, God's great, and that's how we do it. And, you know, you think about it. And it's just amazing to me, Carolyn, too, about, you know, all the sports that are really locked down. And as hard as it is, you know, if you look at my wrist, I got the, uh, you know, the temperature thing and all the protocols they got. But still, we're you know, we're, they're running. You know, racing is still running. So it's really cool, you know, in a way. You're in a sport that... You know, that, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I, I'm a fan guy, as you know, I'm a people guy. Yeah, sure. It has been times I'm sure in my career, you know, you get a little short or with people, but I love just talking to people. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. And 
Well, in the way you talk, Nick. So we go back to 96. I yeah. show up in Florida. I'm working for Tony Slotkin, one of the producers at ABC right. Sports. She's also in. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Craig Janoff was on the show. And I think Kurt Gowdy and Natalie Jowett. Yeah. And all these just awesome people. And here you are, this New York guy. And I hadn't traveled a whole lot in the country at that point. I was just getting started. And your New York accent and your love for the game, it was just like a whole nother world compared to racing on the West Coast. Yeah. And uh, you brought a passion to the game that I hadn't seen in very many people. And I believe you still hold that passion for oh, racing. Thank you. Well, thank you. I really do. I mean, I'm a, you know, when I got to the Hall of Fame in 2005, I kind of stole a, a line from uh, Lou Gehrig when he said he was the luckiest fan alive. I mean, luckiest man alive. I I used the word and said, I'm the luckiest fan alive. And that's what I tried to tell him in the uh, Hall of Fame. I said, I'm the luckiest fan alive because I'm still a fan of racing. And that was 15 years ago. Uh, And I'm still a fan. And I'm glad, you know, I'm really grateful to, you know, to, you know, to the Lord. One thing about it, I think if you say God now or the Lord now, no one's going to say anything. They used to, you know, Whatever they saw that you know you, you're preaching or you're saying God, well, guess what? Uh, it's too bad. I mean, with, with everything going on today, you know what I mean? Uh, man ain't going to help you, so we might as well say God. But what I'm saying, thank God, is from 2005, at least we won the races that are important, and I'm really proud of that. Like, in other words, we got in the Hall of Fame 2005, so. You know, not to sound like Woody Stevens, but let's say, well, 2007, you know, eight, whatever it was, we won the juvenile, 2008, you know, the juvenile with uh, War Pass. And then 2010, we won, you know, like the Florida Derby and Pennsylvania Derby and uh, second in the Preakness, the Belmont, the Derby that year. And, you know, we stopped uh, 2008, uh, I mean, 2000. You know, uh, Big Brown. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is, at least we won some grade ones after we got into the Hall of Fame. You know what I'm saying? Which I thought was uh, very important to our career. So I'm very happy and I'm thankful to the Lord that uh, at least I could say that. That was good. And you want to know something? That week was unbelievable, the Hall of Fame week, because commentator... Before we got in there, won the Whitney with Gary Stevens, you know? I love commentator. We beat St. Liam, who was eventually horse of the year. But that week, we went into the Hall of Fame. So wow. that was that was like really special. Wow. You know, holy God. For the farmers, and they were friendly with Mary Lou. They were her friends. And, um, you know, of course, Mary Lou was there. So the year before was, you know, it's sort of, that really worked out cool. That was a really cool thing. Commentator was a horse that had an incredible presence. I remember seeing him up at Saratoga, and I'm just like, Nick, who is that? He was right. just the man. And he was yeah. really a man amongst boys because you had really uh, flourished with young horses and done so well with the three-year-olds. But Commentator, yeah. you did well as an older horse and really cemented that. How important was that to your resume? Well, I, I think if you look it up, I think it was eight when he won the second one. And he almost won a third one. He might have been nine. You have to look it up, but I'm pretty sure, you know, he was that, you know, he was, I think he was eight, <laughs> something like that. Or seven, but you that know. was so far from your work yeah, with right. all these three-year-olds. Young horses, right. Yeah, well, that's that's what you say, you know, which I'm grateful for the horsemanship. You got to know something about horses to, you know, to do that, to keep them going. and. What was the key to keeping commentator going? Well, you know, obviously, we all, he also had some great owners. You know, the farmers were terrific because, you know, every time I needed to give him the time, I gave him the time. And, you know, it's a change game today. It's, you know, you have some wonderful owners. I, I train for some great people, unfortunately. But, you know, if they have partners, the partners push and they want to know and, you know, the instant gratification of why we have to do this and, and a lot of times it don't work. I understand their, you know, their frustration because of, of the expenses in the game. But commentator happened to work. You know what I mean? And yeah. a lot of times it does. A lot of times it does. I mean, it just it pays off if you're patient. And some horses have these little issues that, you know, 
you got to work for him. But he's living a great life. He's still at old fr- friends and uh, he's getting up there in age, but he's having a great life. I'm sure you keep in touch with Michael Blowen and find out. Oh, yeah. How he, well, doing. I, can't, I can't. Yeah. The good thing about Michael Blowen, he never plays hide and seek with a racetrack. So if there's a window that he could bet two dollars or there's a beer where he could he could drink. He's his happiest guy I've ever met. <laughs> so I love I, I love it. So wherever I am, once in a while I'll run into him, whether it's at Keeneland or Saratoga or somewhere. You know, he's just he's a great guy. And the other thing I like about Michael, he, he's a real fan of racing. Yeah. Which I love. Which I, you know, besides the job that he does at old friends, but he he really loves the game, you know, and uh he's a terrific guy and uh He's, you know, he's, he, he should, I don't know, has he ever won an award yet, Michael, to, for his service? Has he ever, anybody ever given him like an award? Like a big sport of turfdom or something yeah, like that? Yeah, something like that, because he, boy, that guy really deserves it, you know? He does. He does. I want to go back to commentator for a second. You mentioned how yeah. you were able to give him time off. Yeah. We saw this go, when I first came around in the, in 1990, I worked for Charlie Whittingham in California. There you go. Wow. And. Yeah. Everybody gave horses time off back then. Yeah, and there were so many know. farms near the track where you could do that. And that's now become a real item of suspicion. If you bring a horse back off a layoff, yeah. you're kind of scrutinized at a very different level. How do we shift it back where giving a horse yeah. time is viewed as a good thing instead of a nefarious thing? Well, I don't know how much of an audience you got. I, I, I pray that you, you'll have a big audience someday. But people like you who have been there in the trenches work for these tremendous trainers like you've worked for and preach that gospel out there, it may it may help. You know, uh, on the other hand, you know, a lot of these owners are not basic, even though they they are the final say, they listen to some of the people that work for them or they're just not in the habit. They feel the money's being thrown away and whatever it is. But I think there should be more of that. And then they'll see their investment will pay off. And, you know, because see, here's what happens to a trainer's afraid. You say, what do you mean a trainer's afraid? The horse goes to the farm. They never get him back. You know what I mean? He goes somewhere else. He goes to some guy that's doing well. Or the horse goes to the farm, then the owner's suspicious. Or why does he need time? Or why does he need this? break you know i i thought you said uh he didn't have you know he, you know he or she said i thought you said they didn't have any problems i said well they don't they're just you know they're just minor you have to take care of them because if, if you don't take care of them now they'll become major but a lot of them you know they push the envelope like well I, I, i'd rather move on and get another one and if you're fortunate enough to have an owner that will buy you another one then you don't feel as bad, but I feel like sometimes the trainer is a little bit of handcuffed because he wants to do so well for the owner, you know, whether it's he or she, and, you know, uh, he can't. Now, I've been fortunate right now. I have a few owners, and every one of them, I can say, is uh, their horsemanship is divine, basically. You know, I don't know anyone that I train for now. Uh, that won't give a horse time if they need it or won't, you know, uh, do the right thing if they don't need it. You know the names. I mean, uh, Nina Moss, what they call Massa Rosen, and, of course, Toby Keith and Lyndon, which they call Dream Walking and his partners. You know, they're they're terrific, and few people I have, you know, uh, have a horse, you know, a horse or two for coffee pot. Not many, but they send me a horse, and they're, they're you know, they're, they're all good people, like, that's what you need if you're a trainer. But I think what you your point is extremely valid. I really think that message should be out there. And it's hard because of the finances today. So, but, I mean, think about the trainer you're talking about. How many, you know, we, we bragged on commentator. You know, he was eight. I think he won to Whitney. And however, you, you know, he, he won it twice, 2005, then three years later, and almost in you know, he won in 2008 and then almost in 2009. But think about the great Charlie Winningham, all the great older horses he had. My God, this tremendous trainer. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and you know what I love uh, about Charlie, too? And I used to see this with Mandela and other guys. There was a yeah, limit to the number of stalls they could have at the track. So they would go. tell an owner, they would say, 
listen, I'd be happy to take your horse, but he'll have to be down at San Luis Rey or somewhere where I'm not seeing him every day. Or maybe you send it to this guy down the road who's a really good trainer, yeah. small barn, right. and it would fill out yeah. these smaller barns and really create yeah. more competition. Oh, that was incredible. That's and that's the, the kind today. of generosity of spirit that I used to see yeah. from these trainers. Oh, that's a, well, what you're saying is just music. You know, it's just beautiful music. The most we ever had, I remember asking Tim Poole, my longtime assistant, he's retired now, but we, I, I think we got up to 96. And I think I might have had, no, but I might have had five in the Derby that year. <laughs> and I think we only had, like, we were in New York, and I might have had, like, 15 in Delaware. Had like 35 at Saratoga and 35 at Belmont. Okay. That, and that was too much for us. Yeah. 96. Wow. And I think I never hit over 70. See, and that's when I was winning triple crown races and winning grade one races. Right. And I don't know how. I mean, look, I, I have to tip my hat to them because I don't know how they keep up with them. I mean, everybody says, well, they got assistance, they got good assistance. Yeah, but. Still, your name is on the program, and to have that many horses and to do the and, and they actually do well. So, you know, but I think you're right. I think the game would be better off. I mean, I don't look. I'll tell you a, st- a stat. First one, I don't think anybody. I might have told somebody else this. Actually, I think I did. I might have told my good friend Ron Moquette's son this. So we're in barn two. I have eighteen horses. This will shock everybody. So the, I would talk to Woody, naturally pick his brain up. He, he liked me. We had, we had fun. And, you know, they had the, the Derby, they had Swale and all these good horses. But Woody won five Belmonts yes. in a row. In stall, in barn three, or 18 stalls. And in barn four, I believe. I'm pretty sure I got it right. He had 36 stalls. Yeah. And he won five Belmonts in a row. With 36 stalls. Right. So you see, you, they, that's a stat. Forget the five in a row. How about what I just One. told you? <laughs> yeah, that's why I admire uh, Shug McGay so much. I, you know, a lot of people, they say, oh, you know, he's got the horses. He's Shug McGay. He trains for the Phipps. That's right. And the Phipps is a great people. Uh, they did a lot for business. People don't even know that I do. But you think about it. Think about it. Shug's the same type of guy. He doesn't have a million horses. You know, he has quality horses, but he liked to, you know, to, to, to be around them, to, to supervise them. So I always, you know, for me, like I root for him a little harder than, you know, I don't, I don't have anything against anybody. Trust me, anybody. Steve Asmussen always says hello to me every day, and I think he's got nine Z in horses. <laughs> so I, can't, I can't count that. I don't even know how they do it, honestly. And, and this is crazy. He actually does a good job. When I say this, he knows his horses. Like he does. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm he very knows impressed details. with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with that. He knows his horses. Smart guy. But, but, but the most important thing, what I'm saying is, you're probably right that friendship that trainers had years ago, that's probably the way to go, and, and the game would be better, better off for it. I mean, it's still a great game. It's the greatest game. It's still played outdoors, you know. But... Um, there are things that obviously could be done. I think that, you know, hopefully this podcast could uh, could bring some light to it. You're doing a good job, I think. Oh, thanks, Nick. I appreciate it. It's fun, yeah. and we're getting some really good response. But you mentioned a couple of names. Um, one of them was Buddy Jacobson. Yeah. What What's the most important thing he taught you when you worked for him? Well, you know, it's funny. He was a claiming trainer, and he told me a horse's classes in his legs. And, you know, in other words, make sure you take care of the legs because obviously, you know, that's that's a big part. Horse, you know, that horsemanship. And, you, you know, even though he's like he was a claiming trainer. And then my next, you know, one of the guys I really learned a lot from was Leroy Jolly. I just worked a little bit for Leroy. But Leroy was a fella that um, knew the business inside and out. I actually worked for a California trainer that came to you know, called Bobby Lake. He was another guy that was a very interesting guy. You know, I talk about this thing, and thank you for saying the passion I have in my blood. But Bobby Lake, we had a horse. I'm trying to think of his name. I got the picture. 
Richie the Clocker at Belmont could probably tell you if he's listening, he'll uh, he'll 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 punch it in. But Bobby Lake trained for a guy named Wern Vern. I'm sorry, Vern Winchell. He was the Donut King. He had a horse called Donut uh, King. Yes, that's the fella that owns Tap It. That's his dad. Yes, Ron, who's done a tremendous job, and obviously his dad would be extremely proud of him. But that's how far back I go. But Bobby uh, was a good horseman. I worked my ass off of Bobby. Excuse the expression, because he he would make I'd rub like eight horses or something. Then I worked for John Campo, who was a very good horseman in his day. But I think Leroy. Uh, and John had some, you know, he had a derby winner and had some good. I worked for him before that, a little before that. But Leroy had the derby horses, all, but he taught me the business, and I thank him for it. I thank Leroy. When Leroy, you say that, you. what's the most important? Well, lesson I didn't you know. Me? Yeah, I didn't know the business angle. Like I just knew about horsemanship. I knew about, you know, for the trainers I worked for. But Leroy would explain to me how the business works you know, about sales and about the, the actual business, you know, and how you prepare some of these horses for big races. And I watched a lot of, a lot of people do it, but, you know, Alan Jerkins was my hero, Frank Whiteley, you know, those were guys that I just, wow, I was in awe. Like, you know, if you're a baseball player, you look at the Babe Ruth, you look at, you know, basketball player, Michael Jordan, you know, we, we looked at that, you know, I, I wouldn't not, I looked at that, you know, yeah. And um, let's look at Frank Whiteley for a second. What's the most know, interesting thing you saw him do with a horse? <laughs> well, if you walk by his barn, which I did at Belmont, you could go fishing. Just bring your, your fishing pole with you. Of course, there'd be f- floods. He'd, he'd, he'd be out there hosing, you know, whether it was Forgo or one of those horses for hours, you know, and then he'd be grazing them. And, and when you say hose, you don't just mean putting water on their back. Tell yeah, them. but no, the hose, like put the hose on their legs. Yeah. He would hose them. Yeah, cold water. He loved that. And, For like uh, 20, 30 minutes at a time per yeah, leg? Yeah, more, even more. Yeah, 20, 30 minutes. And, you know, you could see the water. <laughs> but he, you know, and it was, he just was a great trainer. Just, and he'd always have his rub rag in the back of his pants. You know, he was a horseman. And, you know, that's a... Uh, that's a big thing. And, and of course, I think should work for him. So that's a big thing. You know, you, you got to have that horsemanship. And, and, and unfortunately, it's a lot of it's not there. I mean, they're, they're uniformity today. You go to the top barns today, they all look nice. And, you know, it's all neat and clean. And, you know, they have a good presentation. But the actual horsemanship, I don't think is there anymore. And, um, you know, it's just a business. It's a very, very powerful business, and uh, that's how they do it. But uh, thanks for bringing that up. What about Woody? When you you had a lot of laughs with him, and I've heard you talk about him forever. Tremendous. The the thing is, like you know, again, his detail, the way he did things, and uh, I watched him do things with horses sometimes. The way he breathes them certain way and uh i was actually telling max the other day you know i used to do this these things and sometimes you're going to go back to them there were just certain things that and you know woody would do or alan would do they would you know they would do things different and uh and um it would it would you know it would work for me well i mean the training part like uh yeah you know alan would let let's say alan would work uh like woody would stop well it's not with woody he would stop let the horse catch his breath when? And then work. Where? Then work them. Let's say at the, let's say he galloped the horse around. Then I watched him a couple of times. Tell the rider, just stop him, let him catch his breath, and then let him start over again, and then let him breathe. Really? Interesting. Yeah, interesting. And then Alan, it's an interesting thing to do. You have yeah. to have a good rider. You have to have a good rider. And Woody always had good riders. Then with Alan, you know how he'd work him around the turn. And uh, you'd see that a lot. I think Jimmy does that too a lot. And sometimes. when you say work around the turn, you mean gallop out after the work? Yeah, like, no, let's say you start from the, oh, let's say the five, let's say you start from the wire even, you know, uh-huh. like some tracks. And then you work around the turn five eights. You uh-huh. change up once in a while. 
you know, you do all those things. That's horsemanship to me. That's just not a routine. Break off at the half mile pole, right. gallop out, you know, make sure you come home, you know, decent, you know, don't, so don't go nuts first time out. You know, don't let's go, go deeper. Why, sure. why would he work a horse around the turn? From Alan? the wire. Yeah. I don't really know. You'd have to ask him. He's gone now. <laughs> but but I'm sure he had his reasons. And I don't know if it's to catch their breath better, or I don't know if it's to make sure that uh you know uh they have to do it someday or I you know, whatever it was, it was just different, you know, some days. But but you look at like Alan Jerkins, he beat so many great horses. He beat, you know, all the best horses. The giant were. killer. Yeah. yeah. And he'd work them a slow mile, like forty two. And then he'd do something, he'd blow them out. But like, you know, he'd do these things that were unusual, you know. They, but I don't think he could do it today as much, Carolyn. Again, I say it again, and it's a broken record, but I think everybody knows it. No offense to anybody, because we know their breeders try as hard as they could. But I don't know if it's just the bloodline itself that we watered down the bloodlines, that they took all these mares in the 80s. And I uh, never brought them back, maybe, but uh, they don't make them like they used to. Are you telling me the top three-year-olds in the country are just being dismantled? There has to be a reason to that, right or wrong. They right. certainly backed off on the medication. They certainly backed off on the protocols. They've certainly watched everything they can do. You know, so it's not that, you know, uh, no one's been monitoring these these horses, they all, you know, where you, where you come from, you know, in California, very strict. Kentucky, very strict. New York, very strict. So what does that tell you? It's got to tell you something that the breed isn't as strong as it used to be. Right or wrong? It would make sense to say that. So how do we improve that going forward? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Get those mares in 1980 from England, Ireland, Saudi Arabia, and bring them back, I guess. I don't know <laughs> what I mean. To, you know, what I'm saying is, is that, and if you look at, let's say, Claiborne, great breeders or the Phipps's or something, they still manage to, you know, Mr. Farish, you know, they still manage to to come up with the code of honors or, you know, whoever I'm leaving out. You know what I mean? Claiborne over the years. Sure. And, and the Farish. You know, like what I'm saying is they, they go into the history, they, their thought, of reading a horse, there's a lot of the thought process in it. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't be surprised if a Mr. Farris studies for hours to breed his meetings. You know, it's not just a whatever. And, I, the, you know, when you say, how do you do? These are not quick fixes. And it's a business. They're selling horses, right or wrong. Right, so. right. And a guy like Suge that you mentioned that you admire, when he gets a homebred, that horse is going to be in his barn and stay with him. And he has got to find the, the key to that horse. That, exactly. exactly. There is no like yes or no, or maybe, or maybe we'll sell him at the sale. It's like, this is your horse and you got to yeah. figure him out. And he's able to do that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's fun to watch. No, so if, if you could pick up the phone right now and call Woody or call Leroy and ask him uh -huh. a question, <laughs> what would it be? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't know. Would Woody, I, you know, Woody would probably uh, say something funny and, uh, you know, make you laugh and, you know, uh, have something good to think about, like uh, some something funny, like, or, you know, how he beat this guy or how he beat that guy and, you know, how they did that. And, and Leroy would be, you know, funny too, believe it or not, and witty at times. So, yeah, you miss those type of guys. But, uh, you know, we're in the 21st century now. So, if you, you know, it'd be different 20 years ago, or, you, know, with the, you know, 25 years ago, what I would ask them. Because the questions today, and, you know, uh, you know, Carolyn, I want to throw this out here. But maybe it's corny, but not really. But... I don't want to get into a political thing, whatever. But you've been on the racetrack. How long have you been on the racetrack? Since I was 17, I was a groom in the summers. Do you know how many different people we've met in our lifetime? And we never, we always got along. Am I right or wrong? Right. right? 
Right. So I think the racetrack is a good model today, you know, and uh, because it is a sport, it's it's a good model. I mean, I don't know of any, you know, I hate to say it, I'm doing this on 17, any, you know, real problems. You know, we'd fight in a shed row. You know, years ago, you can't do that now. We used to fight in a shed row, break it up. We were best friends. But I don't see anything today like the, you know, unfortunately, but I don't, I didn't see much of anything. We got along with everybody on a racetrack. We still do. There's not much, thank God, of, uh, you know, of any disagreements. But, uh, of course, we're in a unique thing. We're taking care of animals. So I guess, the, you know, God's got something to do with that. So I think good. you bring up a good point, too, Nick, in that we're a very multicultural backstretch. Yeah. You know, we have people coming from everywhere, different countries, yeah. uh, worlds apart. And yeah. we all find a way to get along and work and interact. And what I do find is a lot of camaraderie and fun at the track. Absolutely. Especially in the mornings. Yeah. That, well, that's most owners tell you that they love coming out in the mornings. You know, they like it better yeah. in the afternoons. Right. I think there's, there's no pressure on them, too. I told an owner, and I won't tell you his name, but I said, you got to stop thinking that, that, that you're running. He goes, what do you mean? I said, it's the horse that's running, not you. You think you're running out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you get beat, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, they have to carry all our weight when they're out there running sometimes. Yeah. But I think that identifying with a horse that's running is what makes our sport so special, too. Yeah. You don't even have to be the owner to do that. You can be the $2 better or that's you can right. just be the fan. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the exercise rider kind of wants to be a part of things. The groom, the farrier, you know, ev- everyone that has something to do with that. Of course. Work Absolutely. Gets- Absolutely. hundred percent. How have you cultivated that in your staff? You've had guys for, like you said, 45, 48 years. How have you yeah. made it a, a team approach? And Well, you know, the old expression, whether they want to believe it or not, you're only as good as your health. And over my career, I've had some great people that work for me. You know, you, you know, one of them, you know, uh, you know, Maxine, you know, yeah, you know. So, you know, you got to have people that know how to work horses and know how to do things. And I've had a lot of great assistants and a lot of great grooms and they're still with me. You know, I, I think if you went down to sh- my shed row, you know, you start with Leroy, because obviously, you know, he was with me forever or Rod. And you go down to Chevron and, and Gus and, and Ricardo in New York. I mean, he rubbed them rattle song for me. I had him uh, as a groom at like 17 and he's like 40 something now. And, um, you know, some great horses. Uh, so many grooms are still with me. But my, my, my thing is that at least we've done something right that way. Because you have to, you, you have to have really good help and you have to have a good team and you have to have the people that uh, believe in you and uh, happy about that. What have these grooms taught new staff that come aboard over the years? Well, believe it or not, there's not much new staff. I mean, yeah, we have a young guy or two comes to work every summer, uh, you know, and they, they, they talk to them a lot and they, they pick up a lot. And the problem is, is that the young guys say they want to go out on their own right away. You know, they, you know, they come in for a year or two and a couple of years and then they want to go out on their own. We've had some young trainers make it, uh, believe it. I've had some trainers make it now for a while. Danny Gargan used to hold, when I used to, I used to do them up myself, but he used to hold them right song for me. He was his assistant. And little Jason Barkley now is doing well. He worked here. And, uh, you know, there are different guys. Matthew O'Connor now is on his own. There's so many young guys but the younger we don't have the staff like when you say what is you know they teach them well unfortunately we don't have as many uh young people come we do but not as much as we used to have there but they teach them a lot because they got wisdom they got wisdom. it'd be like you you know when you if there was a girl that wants to talk to you you know you 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 rode horses you you've been around the track you're a groom you know you know the story you work for charlie winningham you work for mandela you know, you know, you, you know your stuff. So that's good. I it's remember. Experience. Yeah. I remember when I was first a groom, an old black groom from New York taught me how to do up their legs. He taught me how to rub them down. You remember his good. name? I probably Ollie. know him. Ollie. I probably know him. I'll tell you a story. You said an old black groom taught you how to rub horses. Well, guess what? It was Gene Stevens, Cliff, and 50 Cents. 
that told, taught Nick Zito and told him what to do, how to rub horses. They were all black. Those three guys were black. <laughs> what were yeah. their names again? Uh, Gene Stevens. Okay. Cliff. Cliff. Mm-hmm. And 50 Cent. Because every day he'd ask somebody for 50 Cent. So they <laughs> named him 50 Cent. And they were all black. And they taught me how to rub horses. And I teach these kids how to rub horses. They go crazy when I do it. To this day, not to be a jerk, but you could ask Max or anybody to tell you, I still know how to do a horse up better than most people. And because I spend time with them and you know how to do it. And I learned it from them, you know. And uh, it was one it was one white guy, I shouldn't say, I think his name was Joe Melnick, believe it or not. He taught me a little bit. He was pretty good. <laughs> he was an exception. <laughs> he must have been, a, you know, he was an exception. So he learned from them probably. He was pretty good. But um, that's a long way. We're going way back. Way yeah. Back. You wouldn't have known Ollie probably. He was in Spokane, Washington at that time. Oh, but, okay. okay. You know, is it they were it was a different era there, uh, yeah, kind of sure keeping was. horses together. And, but spending a lot of time rubbing them down. And what always struck me is how much the horses like that. Like when you start rubbing down oh, yeah, their legs, they, they it almost puts it. them to sleep. Yeah, they get used to it. Right. They get used to it. And then you do your standing bandages all nice with the nice, even yeah. spacing. and That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I used, to, I used to, I always tease the grooms when I'm done with a horse. I would always say, see, it's like they're painted on, you know, the way I do them. I said, like they're painted on. Yeah. When I first started, I wasn't that good. And the trainers would yell at me and say, what do you got, boxing gloves on these horses? (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about Maxine and Carlos. They galloped commentator, both of them. Yeah, well, that that was a great team then because, see, uh, Carlos would gallop them and then Maxine would work them. And it was just, it was incredible. I remember the time uh, Maxine worked them for the Whitney. I, I mean, I just couldn't wait for the race to... You know, just couldn't wait for the race. And sure enough, you know, he beat St. Liam. And that at that time, going a mile and eighth, they ran both. And St. Liam became horse of the year that year. But they, they ran 120 by it that day, both of them. Wow. Yeah, going a mile and eighth. And that, and then, like I said, that was, a, that was a big deal for me because I went to the Hall of Fame after that. And uh, that, that week we got into the Hall of Fame. So it was special. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, Matt, you know, yeah, Carlos uh, and Matt, that was a great team because Carlos would gallop them and, you know, Max would work them and it worked out perfect. You know, then Carlos would work them slow and then Maxine obviously would put the finishing touches on them, which was great. We did it a bunch of times. And one of the look, if you look at it, uh, Birdstone's, you know, that training job was tremendous. They were a great part of that, integral part of it. And, uh, that was terrific. You know, it was terrific. Before I let you go, just tell me, what was it about training Birdstone that stood out? What did you have to do differently with him to win the Belmont Stakes? I mean, I saw him at Gainesway last fall, and I'm like, oh, they said, who do you want to see? I said, Birdstone. Isn't that great? Because <laughs> he's just such a little dude. He's so strong. Yeah. yeah. But tell well, me Well, he was that. a special horse. I'll tell you why. We came in a barn. My son Alex was with me. He goes, who's that? I said, it's Birdstone. And they had thought they made a mistake on the farm. They had thought he was a storm cat, but he was by Grindstone. They had, honestly, they had thought they'd send me the wrong horse. But you we, we were supposed to be like a storm cat. Right. Like that. It was crazy. Oh. You know, it was Mary Lou, Whitney, one partners, I think, with W.T. Young. But we were happy. I was happy uh, to get Birdstone. And then, you know, as he trained and he, you know, went on, and, and a lot of people don't know, but uh, I, actually, uh, Andy Shirley brought this up the other day. It works for. Uh, Fox Sports and Naira. He said, you know, Nick, uh, a lot of people don't give Birdstone credit. He was a great horse. He was a better horse than people think he was. I said, yeah, he was. So he won first time out. First time out, which is hard for us to do because we don't push him. That was Whitney Day. He won first time out. And then, you know, as a two-year-old, he wins the Champagne, which is not an easy race to do. No. And then he wins... He wins the Belmont Stakes, beating, you know, Smarty Jones. And then I wait for the Travers, and he wins the Travers. No prep race. We no Haskell. I think, we were, I, yeah. I think we were the first ones to do that at the time. No Jim Dandy, no Haskell, no, just right to no, the Travers. No, okay. Yeah, I think we were the first ones at the time. A lot of people try to do it now, I think, and they have been, maybe they've been successful. But anyway, uh, 
that was great. So he was, you got to have a special horse to do that too. And of course, what you said, you know, uh, Carlos and Max, that was good. You know, you know, and then of course the groom, Jose, uh, he's been with me 20 something years too. He's, he's been great. So, you know, it's a, it's a team effort. You know, I'm sure you talk to the right people and they all tell you the same thing. You got to have that team and you got to have that thing. And, you know, we're going to keep fighting. I like to, like to get one, you know, I like to, to get a hit. I like to be like Frank Sinatra and get a hit record again before we leave here. <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me that's going to happen, Nick. Oh, that's cool. Well, I like we got that. people like you rooting for us, Carolyn. We'll, we'll make it. Always. Always. Well, you do a great job and, and God bless. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Bye, Nick. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Racehorses Etc. Please go to carolynconley.com and become a Racehorses Insider. We'll keep you up to date with exclusive content and more. That's it for now. Remember, until we meet again, enjoy the horses.